we are ready to go. Uh, yes, uh, it's four o'clock in my local time. So, yeah. Hello, good nice morning, start. good evening, or good afternoon. Welcome to the Topology Optimization Webinar. Um, today is our 16th session. It's uh, organized by Professor Yimin Xie from RMIT. So, thank you for putting together this session. Uh, please go ahead, Mike. Okay, thank you, Tling. Good morning, good afternoon, and to my Australian colleagues, good morning. My name is Yiming Mike She. I'm from RMIT University in Melbourne. It is my great pleasure to host the 16th top webinar. On behalf of the organizing committee, I welcome you all. In today's session, we have five interesting but different topics. And the first presenter will be Simon Thomas from the University of Sydney. Simon is currently a PhD student working with professors Ching Li and Grant Stephen. Simon, when you are ready, you may start sharing your screen. Over to you. Okay, hopefully you can all see that there. Okay, so my talk today is on finite periodic topology optimization with oriented unit cells and myself, Simon Thomas, with my co-authors Ching Li and Grant Stephen, all out of the University of Sydney, are very pleased to be able to bring this talk to you today. So the main topic of this talk is on periodic design, and it's a architectural and structural design that's seen all throughout the world, and an example of it's in the background of this slide. And it's essentially where we build a larger structure out of a set of smaller repeating components. But unfortunately, there's quite limited topology optimization literature on periodic optimization for finite periodic structures, which is what we're looking at today. So you might ask yourself, why do we want to use periodic design? Well, it's fairly simple. It can be cheaper to manufacture because we're using smaller components, easier to transport and assemble, and also the repair and replacement process becomes simpler, all because we're using smaller repeated unit cells. If we look at a structural bridge design using typical single component topology optimization, we get a very efficient structure with a compliance of one in this case, but it's very difficult to manufacture and implement in practice. So we might want to use periodic optimization to construct, say, a four by one bridge structure. And in this case, we're going to sacrifice some level of optimization or efficiency, but in return, we get the periodic design benefits that we just discussed. So you can see here the compliance is raised to 1.5, but because of the repeated unit cells, we have a better manufacturing outlook. So that's where we're going to introduce oriented assembly today. And dependent on the given unit cell geometry in a periodic structure, it may be possible to orient a unit cell in a variety of different ways. And different orientations may be possible for the same location in the periodic macro structure. Thus, there could be many different permutations of structural assembly for a given periodic structure. And each of these configurations may have a different degree of influence on the objective function that we're trying to optimize. So here we can introduce just the typical translational assembly that's seen in most periodic optimization literature. And if we have a three by two macro structure, we can simply take copies of the representative unit cell and fill them into positions in the periodic tessellated grid of potential cell locations. But each unit cell in this case shares the same upright orientation state. What we can note though, is that there's no necessary reason that we have to do it that way. We could orient the unit cells in any particular way as long as they still fit within their region. So for example, here we've oriented at a 90 degree rotation. And that's true for each of the different orientations states in each of the different unit cell locations. And as we can see, we have the same periodic unit cell, we have the same periodicity in the macro structure, but a very different macro structural layer because the orientation configuration has now changed. So this is applicable to many types of unit cell geometry. We have squares, rectangles, triangles, and hexagons on this screen, but of course, other options are also available. For simplicity's purpose, we're just going to use square unit cells today. And that takes us back to the four by one structure we looked at earlier. 
but now we can look at it through the lens of an oriented arrangement of unit cells. And in this case, we get an optimized design with oriented unit cells that have the same periodic constraint, but actually produce a periodic structure with a lower compliance value, in this case, 1.36, so in essence, we've maintained the structural benefits and manufacturing benefits of periodic optimization, but through specific oriented arrangements, we've reduced the structural compliance of the periodic macro structure, which is obviously a good thing when you're trying to optimize these structures. To do this, we use a sensitivity analysis, and in our published manuscript, we looked at compliance and natural frequency criteria, the equations of which are seen on the slide here in the middle section. And what we need to do for periodic optimization is take the macro structural sensitivity and map it into the representative unit cell domain, which is our design domain in this case. And that can be done by a simple averaging function, which is seen here. However, it, in the oriented arrangements, we need to account for the relative location of a given element with respect to the orientation of a given unit cell when we apply this averaging scheme. To try and visualize that process for you, I have an animation here, where first we'll look at how a traditional translational periodic might be, the sensitivity might be formed. So we simply take the translational uniform assembly and average the sensitivity at each of the locations, giving us a uniform translational sensitivity pattern. We can then do the same thing, but with an oriented arrangement, and here you can see the regions of high sensitivity end up overlapping neatly with one another. And the way that we've now derived these different sensitivity patterns for the same unit cell leads to very different optimized designs and ultimately different optimized periodic macro structures. So the question then remains, how do we determine the best configuration? Well, we could use brute force computation to test all possible configurations. And although this is guaranteed to find the best configuration, it's very difficult to scale for large periodic structures. So instead in our paper, we've introduced a sensitivity-based selection metric where essentially we're quantizing that degree of overlap between high and low sensitivity regions. And that allows us to select at the outset, say a more viable subset of configurations that are likely to produce more efficient periodic structures for the given configurations. However, this is still difficult to judge on the outset of optimization, how a structure will perform once it's fully optimized, which leads us into the final methodology that was presented in our paper, which is a heuristic method to update the orientation state of given unit cells in a periodic structure. And although this heuristic method indicates very effective results, it does lack a certain level of robustness. So here we'll just jump into some example results. And we have a 16 by four periodic structure on the left for bridge structures and a 20 by five on the right. In the middle row, we have just the traditional trans translational uniform periodic arrangement that you would see as a result of implementing most optimization literature on this topic. And at the bottom, we have our derived oriented periodic structures. In the graphs, you can see that the oriented structures achieve a significantly lower compliance value. And you, you expect that level of difference because visually we get very different structures between the uniform arrangements and the oriented arrangements. And in these particular cases, we're looking at compliance reductions of between 15 and 25% between the uniform translational structures and the oriented structures that we derived. So in this GIF here, you can see the heuristic method updating the orientation state of some unit cells throughout the optimization to orientations that it determined would be a better configuration in regards to the objective function. Now, whilst it's effective, this actually doesn't guarantee even a locally optimal solution in the way we implemented it in our paper. So one might ask, can the discrete nature of this problem where unit cells have to exist in a specific orientation, orientation state, can that be overcome? And the answer is yes, it can, by using a DMO-based SIMP approach and that's a future research topic that we're now looking into. So to conclude the remarks about the paper that was actually published on this topic, 
Essentially, finite periodic structures can alleviate some manufacturing issues, but almost all periodic optimization literature utify, un, utilizes uniform translational periodic arrangements. And those uniform translational arrangements are simply a special case from the larger set of potential permutation options of a periodic structure. Specific oriented arrangements can significantly increase the macrostructural efficiency of the periodic structure compared to those traditional arrangements. And we presented a heuristic method to find better configurations, but future work that prov provides a more robust solution may be warranted. And a DMO-based solution is currently in development, which addresses that robustness issue. That actually brings me on to that second topic, the DMO-based topic. And I have a couple minutes left, so I'll very briefly introduce that. So the topic, the follow-up topic would be a discrete material optimization approach for finite-oriented periodic structures. And it has the same list of authors with the addition of Chi Wu, again out of the University of Sydney. So it, to overcome the discrete problem of unit cells, what we can do is use a SIMP approach to allow all orientation states of all unit cells to exist within a periodic structure simultaneously. And so an example of that is seen here where we have a unit cell design on the left, four rotational orientation states of that unit cell, each with a weighting factor of 0 0.25, giving a cumulative unit cell on the right hand side that would appear in the macro structure. Through use of sensitivity formulations and optimization techniques, we can drive those weighting factors to extreme values of either zero or one, so that in the converged design, only a single orientation state of each unit cell is left in the macro structure. We use a typical modified SIMP formulation here as seen in the top of this screen, but we introduce into the formulation for the X value, these weighting factors for each possible orientation state of each unit cell, giving us a new formulation for the compliance. Thus, this allows us to calculate sensitivity values for both the, with respect to compliance, both of the elemental density and the uh, weighting factor for a given orientation state of a given unit cell. And then through optimization techniques, we can optimize those values. An example of this process is on the screen here. We have a typical uniform arrangement seen on the left, and we have the derived oriented configuration on the right. And what you'll note is in the oriented configuration, it's automatically deriving the final, uh, all out of all possible orientation states, it derives what the algorithm sees as the optimized version and it goes from a non-periodic formulation when it starts and resolves into a periodic formulation. And finally, we've tested this algorithm now for a variety of periodic structures, especially for this case study. And as you can see, across the board, we get significant compliance reductions between the oriented variants and the traditional variants in current literature. Thank you for listening to the talk today. Uh, our contact details are on the screen and the published paper details are also there as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon, for your very clear presentation. Um, we have uh, two minutes for questions. Um, do we have any question from the audience? Maybe I make a start while we are waiting. Um, do you have any discontinuity problem between the neighboring units and how do you deal with this? Yes, sometimes those discontinuities can occur. Uh, so if, for example, if we can see on the screen here, there's certain unit cells would disconnect in the sense that the edges of that unit cell wouldn't connect to more material. But unless uh, there's floating material that's fully disconnected, I don't really see this as a problem because the oriented arrangement is derived or is optimized and it thinks that that disconnection is an adequate sacrifice for the mm -hmm. overall oriented arrangement that is obtained. So it's a bit hard to see on this one, but there are other examples that we've had that have very obvious discontinuities 
but ultimately still have much, much more efficient structures than the uniform arrangement that we would see typically. Okay, and thanks, also, if, if there was an issue with that floating material or disconnections, there are algorithms out there to address that, but we haven't implemented them specifically. Okay. Um, we, I can see Jing Wu raised his hand. Jing, Jing, do you have any question or any question yes. from the audience? Yeah, yeah Jing. Yes, I mean, thank you for a great presentation. I really like the animation you show at the very beginning about this, uh, this bridge. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, at the end of your talk, you mentioned this DMO, the discrete material optimization to find the configuration. I'm wondering, what, do you also consider to extend further to consider multiple unit cells? Like if you have yeah. two unit cells, you have different orientation, you might have eight. Yeah, so uh, at the moment, we're only using a single unit cell design and in square unit cells that accounts for eight orientation states for the unit cell. We can introduce two or more unit cells. So you have different unit cells with the same, with each with their own unique design. And the way we would implement that is with, uh, depending on the sensitivity of a given unit cell, we could gradate the amount of material in each unit cell to try and optimize the distribution of material. And that's something we've looked into, but not something that we've published yet. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. Um, to keep the time, we'll have to move to the next uh, presentation um, from Benedict Kriegisman from Hamburg University of Technology in Germany, and also his student, Mika Kress. Benedict. When you're yeah. ready, please go ahead. Thank you, Mike. Um, thanks for the introduction. So as he already said, um, I will present a few slides and then Mika will take over because I broadened the scope of the presentation a little bit uh, beyond what we presented in the paper. And then Mika will talk about more related to the paper. So um, topology optimization, uh, phase safe optimization in general uh, tackles the problem that in certain industries, it's required to design damage tolerant structures that in even case of damage, the structure is still able to carry the load, not only for such large damages, but also for small damages. And one measure to demonstrate damage tolerance is to um, have a design that is capable of carrying the applied load, even if one load path or one structural member fails. And if you look at a normal design problem or optimization problem where you minimize mass with a stress constraint and maybe an eigenfrequency constraint. Um, you obviously have to solve the equilibrium and the eigenvalue problem in each iteration. And if, if, if you extend this to fail-safe optimization, it means that you have to solve um, the equilibrium and the eigenfrequency problem uh, for each failure say, case that you consider. That has already been done in the 70s. It's, quite straightforward to implement that. But as you can imagine, if you have very many structural members, very many failure cases, this becomes very expensive. So this is an example with much more beams, but still relatively simple example, right? You can do um, fail safe optimization here by um, optimizing the beam thicknesses, but the computational cost is like hundreds of thousands of magnitudes higher um, compared to the standard optimization. Another problem occurs when you do that for topology optimization. Here it's quite clear that you can remove these beam elements, but in topology optimization, the structural members, so the beams and the knots that you typically see, evolve during the optimization. So the question is, how do you model this failure? And um, the approach that has been suggested by Janssen et al. was to consider a damage patch area. So a rectangular area, so simplified damage model that you can um, have to place everywhere in the structure during the optimization. So all possible locations of this rectangle are considered as a failure case. So you can imagine this is a very extreme amount of computation that you have to invest in order to get um, a fail safe design, but you indeed get redundant designs like this one. So you get what you want, but it's very expensive. One way to reduce the computational cost is for instance, to neglect cases where this damage patch is in a void area or to not consider each possible location element by element. So to use a, a causa grid, but it, it always ended up with a very large amount of um, simulations here to run at the end. 
So we were thinking, um, why don't you try to capture the this structural members during the optimization? So identifying what is a beam and what is a knot during the optimization, uh, for instance, based on image recognition or based on the principal stresses, and then encapsulate that by simplified damage the shapes and consider those during the optimization. Then the number of patches that you or damage cases that you have to consider is in the order of hundreds, um, which, which is much better than before. And here we updated this every 10 iterations and um, indeed got a redundant design, but you change your optimization problem every 10 iterations very dramatically because when the optimizer doesn't have to consider a failure here, it will put mature here, and then in the next iteration, it will flip back. So most of the times we didn't get convergence with this very heuristic approach. Okay, so that also didn't really work satisfyingly. So what can you do else? else? An alternative way to get redundant designs is to enforce redundancy somehow. For instance, by the approach that uh, Yun Wu uh, suggested to apply a local volume constraint in the vicinity of each element, for instance, in this circle. Yeah, so that's a very cheap approach and you can uh, get a somehow redundant design or to use max member size constraints like Jamie Guest uh, suggests, for instance. But all these approaches, of course, do not explicitly consider fail safety. So we're hoping to get something good, um, even though we're not solving the real optimization problem. So the best thing, or what, what we then thought is a good idea is to take, for instance, this local volume constraint approach as a starting guess, as an initial guess, determine the structural members that the structure has, and then do a shape optimization, where, of course, these damage shapes do not change during the optimization. Um, this converged very fast, so um, within 20 iterations or so, and the computational cost of this overall um, procedure is quite um, reasonable, and, and you still get a very big increase of worst case performance from, from this design to this design. So all these works that I mentioned on topology optimization consider, considering fail safety looked at the compliance, but when you think of, well, fail safety, we think of stresses that cause failure, right? So the stresses should be small, even in the case failure occurs. And that is where our recent paper um, popped up or kicked in. And this is the point where Mika takes over to present. Yes, thank you, Benedict. I'll just share my screen. So I would now like to talk about our recent paper from this year, which is about stress-based fail-safe topology optimization. And since the stresses are in most cases the driving force behind failure, we thought it's uh, especially important for fail-safe optimization to consider stresses there. Um, but stresses come along with certain challenges, not only, but mainly since stress is a local quantity. Thus, maybe it makes a difference uh, to consider uh, different failure patches, for example, round ones to reduce stress peaks. We also worried uh, the amount of failure patch overlap, trying to reduce uh, the failure case count, but still this is uh, very expensive. So uh, we tried an alternative approach to get re a redundant design. Uh, those will probably not be as good as fail safe optimized ones, but maybe good enough. But let's start with uh, the optimization problem for our fail-safe optimization. Here we now have uh, two max functions, one maxing over all failure cases and the second one maxing over all elements in each failure case. Of course, we have to approximate them. And in our case, we choose to do that with uh, the chaos function. Now that we have the different designs from different optimizations, now the question arises, how do we compare them? For that, we developed a load pass based uh, evaluation scheme 
which is inspired by the previous work of my colleague Amboskevich and my professor Pigisma. And um, this scheme uses structural struts and nodes as uh, beta cases. For the comparison on the next slides, we define three quantities, first being the worst case stress, Q max, then we have the maximum stress of the free of damage structure, QFOD, and we have the fail safe factor, which is just uh, the ratio of those two quantities. Now, considering the overlap, we started with no gap and no overlap, resulting in 60 failure cases overall. Then we let them overlap by half, resulting in 216 failure cases. And of course, we have failure cases at all possible locations, uh, resulting in 6,860 failure cases. If you now take a close look on the left-hand side on the secondary load pass close to the clamp edge, you see that it gets thinner and thinner. And consequently, also the uh, worst case stress is increasing. This is all due to the local nature of stresses and quite different to a compliance object. We now consider the failure shape. Uh, we use square failure shapes. We applied a filter to each failure to, failure, uh, to, to round off the edges and to reduce stress peaks. We also considered circles and overlapping circles. If you on this slide compare the worst case stress and the phase safe factor for all designs, you'll notice that the lowest values are obtained for the square failure shape, which was quite surprising. And even more surprisingly, there was no improvement in the convergence behavior. <clears throat> now coming to um, alternative approach, uh, here we choose the local volume constraint approach by Ruyal, and uh, we changed uh, their objective uh, to uh, be the aggregated equivalent stress to be consistent with our fail safe optimization. And if we now take a closer look on the obtained designs, we notice that in case of a failure, the connecting struts between the redundant uh, load paths are rather weak links and they are even loaded in bending, which is very inefficient. If you now take a look on uh, or compare that to a safe optimized design, where we rather get framework like triangular structures, as you can see very nice in the middle. Um, here, in case of a failure, these connecting struts will rather be loaded in tension and more compression, which is, of course, more efficient. So now summing up in stress-based fail-safe topology optimization, it is obviously better to use a low number of failure cases, which is also less critical compared to the compliance objective, um, but still very expensive. The failure shape had a negative uh, influence on the phase safe performance and a neglectable one on the convergence behavior. And uh, the alternative approach, the local volume approach, for instance, is of course a cheap alternative to get redundant designs, but is also very suboptimal when it comes to uh, fail safe applications. So um, we kindly acknowledge the financial support of these two institutions. Um, here are our references for those who would like to look them up. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mika and uh, Benedict. Um, do we have any questions? It seems all very clear. And um, it's time for us to move to the next speaker. Thank you, Mikhail. Thank you, Benedict. Um, our next speaker 
will be Matthew Gilbert from the University of Sheffield in England. Matthew, when you're ready. Thanks very much, Mike. Yeah, so my talk is going to be on layout, uh, an educational web app for trust layout optimization. So actually, this uh, is a web app that was announced at Top Webinar 2 by uh, Helen Fairclough, the first author of this paper. But the paper itself only came out a couple of months ago in SMO. So uh, what is layout? Some of you may have seen it and, and tried it, but if you haven't, I've, I'll, I'll just kick off with a, a short uh, demo video that just, just uh, runs you through uh, how, the, how the, uh, the tool works. So it's, it's probably quite a familiar looking interface. The main difference is that it's using layout optimization or trusted poly optimization to get solutions as opposed to continuum to poly optimization. And you can do various things, um, you know, move the loads, supports around, and also simplify the solutions. And also quite useful for collaborating, actually sharing such solutions with your, with your colleagues as well. Um, with modern web technology, you can also uh, use it also uh, on a, a tablet, uh, a mobile phone, as well as a, a desktop PC. So that's a big difference compared with some of the early web apps that were around uh, in, in years gone by. So that's the, uh, um, the web app. It's available at that link. Um, try the link uh, after this, this talk, otherwise obviously you won't be paying much attention to what I have to say. Uh, I'll, I'll now move on to just give you a little bit of background and then explain uh, how it works uh, for those of you who are interested. So why did we develop the, the web app? Um, Really, uh, the, the key motivation was um, application of topology optimization in the in the construction industry has been it's been pretty low. And in fact, if you look back over the last 100, 200 years, the, the trend has been, actually been in the opposite direction. It's been away from optimization. So we find many 19th century structures which are actually quite optimized. And we look at late 20th century structures where uh, the focus has been on standardization and, and, and real uh, lack of lack of thought when it comes to optimization. Um, and similarly, topology optimization hasn't really penetrated the sector in the way that it has mechanical aerospace and automotive. The issue is that there's a climate crisis. Uh, COP26 is approaching uh, fast. We've really got to mater reduce material consumption. And one way of doing that uh, is to use optimization. So layout uh, was one outcome of a recently completed uh, research project called BuildOpt. And really, we're trying to raise awareness amongst the, the community. And obviously, we were heavily inspired by um, uh, the, the web apps and um, short programs developed by, by pioneers in the field. Um, this is the uh, the web app that, uh, that inspired me to join this 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 community twenty years ago or so uh, by uh, Ollie Sigmund and and, and colleagues uh, uh, working in DTU Denmark. So really really valuable um, for for raising interest in, in, in a field. The problem, I suppose, when it comes to uh, structural designers, for example, is the continuum to poly optimization solutions um, don't really resonate that they're used to dealing with skeletal structures, discrete members, and the sort of uh, the less distinct forms that you typically get from continuous poly optimization didn't res really resonate um, in our experience. So what we wanted to do was make available a tool based on layout optimization or, or trust topology optimization um, to try to raise, uh, raise interest in the field. Um, on the other hand, um, trust the poly optimization or, or left optimization has been around for decades and it hasn't really uh, um, captured the imagination um, to date. Why is that? One of the reasons is that the original numerical left optimization method tended to identify structures that were quite complicated, um, lots of small members that might be prone to buckle and certainly would be difficult to manufacture and uh, a lack of clarity really. So what we wanted to do was actually 
um, embed in the layout um, with our, not just the original numerical layout position uh, formulation, but also some post-processing tools that would provide better solutions or, or, or clearer solutions, but also potentially simpler solutions for those who were, uh, were looking for those. So we basically got a, 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 this two-stage uh, um, process uh, in, in the web app. Linear optimization to start with, and then non-linear optimization in the second stage. Linear optimization stage is, is the well-known uh, ground structure-based formulation developed in the 60s. So we're minimizing volume subject to equilibrium and stress constraints, basically, and we can solve that very, very uh, quickly. Um, one of the things um, um, that can speed it up further, however, is to use a so-called member adding method. Uh, if you connect each node to every other node with a potential member, then you end up with a sort of n squared problem. If you use a uh, member adding, then you keep the uh, number of, of, of um, connections and variables proportional to the number of nodes. And uh, you can see on screen, we've got this, uh, this process, this member adding process going on. It also helps um, the user see that something's happening. So rather than waiting uh, potentially for a few seconds for a solution, you can actually see a solution actually evolving, which is quite nice from the point of view of, uh, of getting a sense of, uh, um, of something happening uh, while you're using the, the app. And if you're interested in the, the, the member adding um, algorithm, there's an implementation of it in a Python script uh, a couple of oh, three years, not two years ago in the SMO, if you're interested in that. Um, so moving on to stage two, um, the first um, part of that uh, stage is actually to, to, to make a subtle uh, change to the formulation. So instead of, um, just changing the, the, the cross-sectional area and, 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 the, and the member forces are also changing the X, Y coordinates of, of nodes. Um, because it's non-linear, we only actually apply that to the solution that's the outcome from phase one, from, or from stage one. So it's quite a, um, a small problem that, that's relatively easy to solve. And you can see in this example, sort of half wheel problem, you end up with this nice uh, evenly spaced spokes after the geometry optimization phase that you didn't see um, prior to that point. And then the next uh, um, thing is simplification. Um, so if you want to simplify um, the solution, so for example, reduce the number of members, then the formulation um, can be changed, uh, I guess, quite significantly. Now what we're doing is we're minimizing the number of, for example, members um, where we have a, a limit on how much we allow the volume to increase to. So if we had a volume of one in, in the original phase, we might say that we're happy for it to increase to 1.1 or, or 10% um, increase in the second phase, as long as we um, have fewer members or we want to have as fewer members as possible within that constraint. And rather than using... Um, for example, a mixed interlinear programming formulation, we're actually using here um, a continuous formulation with a smooth heavy side representation of, of, of on off binary variables representing the existence of, of members. And this, this uh, works uh, very, very quickly, um, although uh, it's clearly not, not nearly as rigorous as it would be uh, using mixed interlinear programming. Here we've got an example where we've got the benchmark problem, which is this complicated uh, um, structure at the bottom. If we allow, for example, a 5% increase in volume, then we end up with a much simpler structure, um, as you can see at the top. Um, if you're interested in the, in the architecture behind uh, Layopt, uh, um, won't go into detail here, it's, it's all contained in the, in the SMO paper, but this is three elements. There's the, there's the client web browser, which, uh, which clearly displays uh, what you can see on screen and allows you to interact with that. There's a cloud server. And then the, um, the third component is a, is a, a serverless compute uh, service. 
um, which basically means that we can scale this very, very easily. So we can have a classroom of 100 students all using this um, without issue because these uh, serverless, uh, um, the serverless compute service, like it's Lambda, Amazon Web Services, Lambda service, allows uh, effectively, um, um, you know, not say an infinite number, but a huge number of of, um, of, um, of nodes to be to be readied uh, in 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 a matter of a few seconds. So effectively, uh, it's much more scalable than, than 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 tying it to to one or two fixed servers. So here's a um, couple of examples. Um, on the left, uh, we've got a nice example just showing how the structure changes when you change the boundary conditions. On the right, we've got a, a bridge type problem, which shows how the problem changes when you change the relative tension and compressive strength of the structure. So it moves from an arch form, arch bridge type form to a, a cable stayed bridge form. And talking of bridges, um, just announced that uh, a few weeks ago, we made available a, a new tool, Layout Bridge, which is still accessible from layout.com. You've now got an option of accessing the, the, the trust version or the bridge version. Uh, really, uh, uh, the, the, our key thing is that it makes it easy to set up bridge problems, but it also um, includes catenary elements, which handle uh, self-weight uh, in, a, in a robust way for long span structures. And then if you're interested in solving uh, using the same kind of methodology, more complex problems, we've also got a, uh, a plugin for Rhino Grasshopper called Peregrine, um, which is accessible from, from the link you can see there. OK, so just to, to conclude, um, it's uh, Playops is a recently developed educational web app, particularly focused on uh, trying to engage construction professionals but it's not something not exclusively the, the hope is it's um, fast and interactive mobile friendly and uh, one of the features is that uh, you can share problems via uh, web link and just before I finish just show the the interface here so we've got now a portal where we can zoom into layouts um, or we can choose the layout bridge and so but by all means, um, after this uh, full webinar has finished, have some fun playing around with this uh, with this tool. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew, for your very interesting talk. Uh, we have a question from um, audience, Mohammed Tarek, um, saying, "Nice app is layout closed source or open source?" Um, Layout is is closed source. Um, I, if you go back to my um, to, to this, it, it will be pretty. Um, the amount of source, the JavaScript, and all the rest of it, it will be very difficult for anybody to make much sense of it, to be honest. Um, but the um, the other thing is that the we're taking advantage of a um, an API that's been developed by um, a spin out company from university called Limit State, who are also interested in making that available in commercial software applications. Um, so at the moment, it's not, it's, it's not uh, open source. Thank you, Matthew. We have another question from Niels. Um, what's the response from the civil engineers in the real world? Um, a good question. I think there's been a, a big change in the last two, three years. There's been a, a sudden realization that they can't carry on operating as they have done because of the climate crisis, uh, particularly amongst younger engineers who are, are very, very focused on that. So there is a lot of, uh, a lot of interest. I mean, I I've been interested in this for, well, since I first saw uh, Ollie Sigmund's uh, web app 20 years ago, um, and in the 2000s, there was very little interest. It's night and day now how much interest there is uh, in this field now. And that's you know while well, encouraging us to to carry on um, putting forward tools like this. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we draw close to these um, presentations. Um, now we move on to the fourth presentation from Jia Mingma from IMIT University Melbourne.
Chaming, when you are ready. Okay, um, thanks Professor Xie for your introduction. Um, Good day and good evening, everyone. My name is Jami Ma from Center for Innovative Structures and Materials at IMIT University. Before starting the presentation, I would like to thank the organizers for initiating the talk webinar and the session today. The topic of my presentation is topology of leaf veins, experimental observation, and computational morphogenesis. This work has been published at the Journal of Mechanical Behavior of Biomedical Materials. My presentation will be given in the following four sections. Background introduction, research gaps, findings, and conclusions. Now, first of all, let's start with the motivation and background introduction. Plant leaves are commonly composed of thin mesophyll and thick veins. The mesophyll of a leaf is responsible for photosynthesis under sunlight. In order, in order to keep the mesophyll cells alive and vigorous, the vein, however, plays an important role for the whole organ. The leaf vein supports the transportation of water and nutrition for the cells in the leaf. And more than that, the vein with higher Young's modulus can also enhance the structural support for the overall leaf blade. We believe the evolution of the leaf has provided an optimized distribution of the veins, and hence its hierarchical pattern can be valuable for the shell structure design. Research on computational morphogenesis of the, of the veins and the branch-like structures have been conducted previously. Computer scientists and the biologists have developed a type of mathematical approach called L-system, which can model the behavior of the plant cells and the growth process of the branches. However, this method can only model a plant morphologically without considering any functional requirements. For example, the structural stiffness and the nutrition transportation. Topology optimization recently have been used for biomechanical morphogenesis. The internal architecture of emergent plants and the morphological optimization of the Scopel Tauschen was studied recently using topology optimization. Concerning this topic of the leaf vein, a principle of golden ratio distribution of veins was proposed previously with a flat plate model. A coupling optimization approach was further developed to simulate the veins, which considered the stiffness, nutrition transportation, size control, as well as the angle control. However, there are still gaps in this study of the computational morphogenesis of the leaf veins the first one is the influence of the curved shape of the mesophyll on the leaf of the vein distribution. Current studies in the literature have only considered the leaf surface in flat shape using plate model. And apart from that, the quantitative investigation comparing the experiment measurement and the optimized results are not sufficient. And so here starts our investigation. For regular 3D brick element or 2D planar element, the stress strain matrix of K is composed of the Young's modulus and Poisson ratio. However, when it comes to the shell element, the D matrix will be composed of three different stiffness, which are the membrane stiffness, bending stiffness, and the shear stiffness. And those matrix are comprised with thickness with different exponents. Since the real plant leaves normally have curvatures on their surface, and the gravity direction usually is not perpendicular to a leaf surface, the optimization mainly considers stiffness could yield quite different results for leaf models with varying curvatures. If only considering the stiffness maximization, our results show that the optimized structures are quite sensitive to the curvature variation of the leaf model. Now, if we look at the dissipation optimization, which is corresponding to the nutrition transportation for leaves, the hierarchical patterns are quite similar for either flat or curved models. Alternatively, if we normalize the sensitivity numbers and assigning them with weight factors, we can couple different objectives for the optimization. 
Here we use a leaf model with ruffles. We can notice that the vertical bars and thick base are important for structural stiffness, which is contrary to the real features of the leaf veins. Apart from simu simulation of the vein patterns, we also conduct experiments to investigate the veins. The three different plant leaves were chosen in this study. The profiles and shapes are quite different. And we also select the samples with different sizes for each kind of the leaves. Now to measure the geometry feature of a secondary vein, we first extract the skeleton line and divide it into two parts as in shown in figure B. And the length is defined from the root to the intersection of its upper neighbor. The angle was measured according to the fitting line along the base segment of the secondary veins. From the lens measurement results, it can be seen that the normalized lens are stable for each kind of leaves. Nevertheless, it is worth mentioning that the samples of them are in different growth stages and hence have different sizes as well as different elevation angles. And next, the measurement results of secondary veins show that the angle distributions are also reasonably stable. For the optimization results from the nutrition transportation, the lens and angle data are also collected here. Despite the shape difference of the four leaf models, their veins exhibit similar lengths and angle relations. Apart from the lens and angle, we further investigate a number of secondary veins. We can see that the numbers are almost the same. Although the samples for each kind of leaves have very different sizes. And on the right hand side, figure B shows the relation between the leaf parameter and the total length of the veins. For each kind of the leaf, the total length of veins increases linearly with the increase of the leaf parameter. And we notice that the three fitting lines shown in gray color have similar slopes. The ratios of the total length of the veins to the leaf parameters are 2.17, 2.63 and 2.93 respectively. The biomechanical mechanism underlying such similar ratios could require further research. Overall, the experiment results show that the van patterns of plant leaves are not sensitive to the change of leaf curvature and size. However, in the previous topology optimization section, we found that the stiffness optimization results depend on the leaf curvatures. However, the results from the transportation optimization shows the opposite. Apart from the veins, with the topology optimization tool we developed, it can be applied for engineering shell structure designs. To achieve manufacturable designs, a robust optimization can be adopted here to obtain designs with clear boundaries. The process of the robust optimization is first to project different designs from the raw design variables, then by optimizing on an eroded design and controlling the volume fraction of the intermediate design, we can obtain results with satisfying manufacturing tolerance. The detail can be referred to Wang's paper. And here we present the results of the manufacturable designs on flat and curved shell models. They are optimized for structural stiffness. And this is not the end. We can also combine the coupling approach with the robust optimization together. And this will make the algorithm practical for enhancing both stiffness and the transportation performance at selected weight factor for a shell structure. Developed approaches can be used for designing efficient and innovative shell structures and can lower the material cost for architectural structures. And here we present a pavilion for an extended work for potential construction. And finally, the presented research can be concluded as below. The multifunction computational method is developed to optimize leaf structures with curved surface. 
The topology of leaf vein is investigated through both experimental observation and computational morphogenesis. Thirdly, contrary to popular belief in literature, this study shows that the structural performance is not a key factor in determining the pattern of veins. Our study shows that the enhancement of nutrition transport plays a predominant role in determining the form of the venation patterns. And finally, the presented methodology can be applied in the design of high performance shell structures. And these are the major reference of my presentation. And finally, I would like to send Professor Mao Chi, Professor Zilong Zhao, Assistant Professor Sun Lin, and our team members in MIT CISM for your advice and support. Thank you. Thank you, Jiaming. Um, we have a question from Professor Ching Li. Um, Jiaming, very interesting presentation, very beautiful work. Can you set up some control on the size and thick thickness for the veins in topology organization? Can you control the size uh, yes. or thickness of yes, the veins? Yes, we, we do can also couple the size control function. So currently, uh, for this result, we only couple the uh, transportation and the stiffness maximization function, and uh, we have tried to um, include the size control function too, and it works uh, very well. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions? If not, thank you, Jiaming. Um, let's move on to the fifth and final presentation from Yi Xia, who used to uh, study at Delft University of Technology, and uh, he is now working at Chongqing University in China. Yi, you may start. Uh, sorry that I forgot to unmute myself. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you for introduction. Uh, also, thank you the com web webinar committee. It's such a nice event. I can always get inspired by listening to others' work. Right now, it's my honor to have the chance to share our work with the audience. So I'm Yi Xia from Chongqing University. The work was conducted at the Delft University as part of my PhD project. The co-authors are Matthias and Max. And today's topic is about the automatic generation of strata models and the designing reinforced concrete structures. Currently, most concrete structures are a combination of concrete and reinforcement. The purpose of reinforcement is to provide additional strength for concrete tension because concrete material, uh, the strength is weak in tension. In the reinforced concrete structure design, the concrete is always fixed. Engineers need to determine suitable uh, place to uh, arrange steel. This and the, the stranger steel arrangement will largely influence its structural performance. Especially designing reinforcements for the region is a difficult job. Uh, in the current research, there are two keywords. One is the strata and time modeling. The other one is the topology optimization. Personally, I would like to give a brief introduction about the strut and time modeling. This method is a trust analogy approach to design e region concrete structures. E region indicates the disturbed region where the strain distribution is highly nonlinear. There are two main factors causing the nonlinear strain distribution the static discontinuity and the geometric discontinuity. The static discontinuity occurs at the loading and the supporting region. The sharp change of the loading transmission is one source of this nonlinear nonlinearities. And they gave the difficulty for engineers to design such regions. And the D region are com common concrete structures in practice. They can use it as cover, deep beam, and bridge pile. It's important for us to provide a safe and economical method for design these structures. We have complex D regions. We will also have the simple region for the B region. B region indicates the Peroni region. This slide will show you the difference between these two regions. This simply supported slender beam 
the tactical B region. The principal stress contour is showing here. In B region, the cross-section can remain flat after deformation. The linear distribution of the string can be easily obtained. With this linear distribution, we can derive the analytical equation to calculate the stress, and then use this stress to determine how much steel we need and where to put. How, however, for D regions as shown in these three examples, with the rapid change of geometry and the load transmission, the string distribution performs highly nonlinear. We cannot obtain the linear distribution and derive the analytic equation for designing these structures. So, in order to design D region structures, strut and time modeling method is proposed. In the standard strut and time modeling method, there are three main steps. For this deep beam, first, we need to create a truss like system to represent the first transform candidate and calculating the equipment forces based on this model. Next, based on the optimal model, we can determine the steel usage and proceed stress checking for strut. Finally, we can design practical uh, layout, steel layouts based on the created model. Uh, this simple implementation of the strut and time model method and the resulting safe lower bound design are preferred for engineers and they have been widely implemented in various design codes and provisions. However, in this method, finding a suitable trust model and with the actual force equipment state is the most important part. And this will ensure the design performances. Uh, and the question, how to determine a suitable strut and time model is still unsolved problem in the standard method. For designing this deep beam, there could be infinite available models. For example, there are two models proposed by previous researchers. The design based on this accurate model will provide a more economical design compared, with, uh, compared to this inaccurate model. Of course, there could be more models for this case. The determination of models requires lots of subjective choices. By using an unsuitable model, we may obtain an overly conservative design and cost more steep. So how to automatically and systematically generate short time models is of vital importance. For this issue, researchers have brought optimization in this field. I believe everyone here is familiar with optimization, so I can save some time by skipping this introduction. I would directly show you the idea of using optimization for the strata modeling. You will find the optimized topology somehow similar to the accurate model. In other words, optimization result can be used as a blueprint for the suitable short time model. However, there is a gap between the topomization result and the strut time model. That is the transition from the continuum to the bus system. Uh, in the past two decades, topomization methods have been widely investigated to find the suitable strut time models. Initially, ground structure based methods are used. Currently, continuum based method is more popular. There are two typical cases have been frequently investigated. Mm, however, despite intensive efforts of using optimization method for strata modeling, how to obtain strata models automatically and systematically is still unsolved. And this program become even more important for 3D cases. And this motivates, motivates us to do this research. So in order to solve this problem, we propose an automatic generation method. This method involves three main steps. Taking this power cap as an example, the first step is the topomization. By using the classical simple method with a compliance minimization, the optimized material can be obtained. The second step is the topology extraction. From the optimized solid, just like models can be obtained automatically in this step. And this step somehow shares the same concept with the private speaker Benedict investigation. Uh, the last step is conducting the shift optimization for the obtained trust like model. Finally, the strata model can be obtained to follow the whole procedure. 
the forces and the layout of this model can be used to design this D region. In the whole procedure, the extracted model here are always not valid for strata modeling because we may fail to obtain the actual force equivalent state. So we need to conduct, conduct the shape optimization. And the, the mathematical formulation is similar to the topolumization program. Here, the optimization program are the load coordinates. In the optimization constraint, we impose the STS factor to ensure actual force equivalent state can be obtained. The STS factor indicates the ratio between actual force and the shear force. When STS equals to one, it indicates that the actual equivalent force is obtained. Here are two examples. The first one is a 3D spiral line, and the second one is a irregular frame. After the shear polarization, a straight line is obtained for the first case, and the STS fact factors increase to almost one. That indicates actual equipment force forces of these two cases are obtained. Uh, at last, uh, in order to validate the performance of the generating models, we use the linear finite element analysis to simulate these designs. In the linear finite element analysis, the cracking and crushing of concrete are considered. The plasticity of steel is also considered. In this post-scala case, this is a manually created model, and this is a generated model. The red bars and the blue bars indicate ties and stress respectively. Here shows the load displacement curve. And both design have the ultimate capacity larger than the design load, the, as shown with a dash line. However, for the generated model, steel usage reduced about 29%. Similarly, in the second case, Hober case, this is a manually created model, and this is a generated model. And in this, uh, again, the, they both need to the safety line, have the uh, larger capacity, larger than the design load. And uh, compared to the manually created model, the generated model reduced steel usage about 18%. A more economical design can be obtained based on our proposed method. So uh, in addition, the proposed method facilitates the design process. More D regions can be investigated based on the proposed method. When the loading conditions and geometry change, showable short-time models can be easily opened through the proposed method. Finally, to summarize, we, here we propose a systematic method to automatically generate strat models. And secondly, the proposed method enables the benefits of optimization to be introduced in the reinforced concrete design. The third one is a future scope. It's a design that automates the reinforcement layout practice, which could be a future research topic. So that's all. Thank you for listening. The relevant works can be found in these papers. Thank you, Yi. We have a question from Professor Matthew Gilbert. Yeah. How do you consider identifying the optimum trust directly rather than indirectly from continuum <laughs> optimization solution? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that, that's true. Initially, people use the ground trust structure for the strata modeling. And I hear Professor Xie, I think, is the first person to use the continuum topolumization for strata modeling. I think um, because previously the trust ground trust structure measure has a program that has many insignificant parts that is quite impractical in, in practice. So that could be the reason people at the start uh, choose a continual top optimization. Uh, I think uh, currently with your work, I see the value using the ground structure-based method in this field. We should right now revis revisit the, this method. So 
it's just a choice. I cannot tell which one is the better, but at the privacy could be some have some issues using the ground trust structure for this field. So I don't thank know. You. I can. Mm, thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, if you are dealing with practical reinforced uh, steel reinforced concrete, how do you consider the interaction between steel bars and concrete? And in your model, or is it possible to consider that interaction? Well, currently, this kind of things is quite practical issues. We just give this question. Um, we cannot consider the inter uh, interaction between interaction problem in current methods. Uh, we will refine it in the practical design. So it's like we have this model. But the model to the practical steel design still have some gaps. So the we may use have some construction measure, measurement to deal with. So we cannot do it right now. We leave it behind for the engineers to uh, consider. Yeah. I, I, I think Matthew raised a very important point. Um, and why, why don't we use the trust models? To do this, if you look at the result um, we're getting, um, all the blue areas they're not they're not useful because they're com they're compression. So you the information you can derive from this trust and time order is the, is the two red bars at the bottom. All the yes. rest they're not necessary. Yes. Uh, in the generation process, we we ignore the concrete part, but when for the safety issue, for safety consideration, in the strata modeling, we should have the strength checking for strut. In that, in that uh, procedure, we need to consider the strut. So, and uh, also for this issue, I have a paper prepared. So it's a, the, 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 this guy uses the trust grounds method. So he has many bars, in practical bars, that to, Lead to the very um, difficult models to to an, analyze to simulate. That's yeah, that, the that's reason. why we need Matthew's new research in order to simplify this. Yes, uh, um, we have ten minutes uh, for general discussion, not for just for the last paper. We can have questions on the previous um, four papers as well. So, uh, if you have any questions regarding any of the uh, five presentations, please um, raise your hand or type your questions in the chat section. Any questions? Um, we have one hand raised. Um, I, I don't know who. It's me. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Jun, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question for Jamin. Uh, Jamie, in your presentation, in your conclusion, uh, you yes. you, one of your conclusions is that mechanical uh, performance might not be the main reason for the vein to grow into that pattern. Um, and I, from your slides, I see the, your simulated gravity. Have you considered the, the pressure load due to the force? And if you compare the gravity of a leaf and the, the pressure load due to a wind, to a very strong wind, which one might be higher, and if the pressure load is higher, maybe that can be a reason to to stimulate the vein to grow into the branching pattern. Yes, uh, thank you, Jun, for your very good question. Um, yes, I, I think that's a very good point, uh, considering the vein load uh, rather than only the gravity. Um, however, however, when we consider the loading, uh, what we mainly uh, thought about it is about uh, the, the portion of the loading because when we consider load, uh, wind load, it's actually quite random. I mean, the directions or the, um, the magnitude are quite random. Uh, however, for the gravity, it's a very static case. And um, I mean, for all the time, the leaf will have its gravity, but the wind loads, I, I mean, um, for some cases, uh, there's not many. There's no many wind in some area, so um, that's the reason why uh, we just ignore the wind in this study. Yeah, yeah. Hope this can answer. 
Well, I mean, probably you can do a calculation about the, which force could be larger, then that can tell which one might be more important for the, for the leaf. And, and you mentioned that the force by the wind might be random, but probably that the force will be like a pressure load, so it's pointing perpendicular to the, to, to the surface of the leaf. That can make things easier, right? Yes, um, so I'm, I'm, let me share my screen here. So um, the point of our research is that the leaves actually have, um, uh, it's, it's not a flat surface, it's actually uh, have a lot of um, different curvatures. So even I have uh, like a wind from certain direction. Um, so we, we can see different area will have different uh, pressure on the leaf surface actually. So yeah, but uh, it, it is a good point that uh, we should um, consider more about the wind low for the future research. Yeah, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? If I can uh, connect to, uh, to the discussion just now and uh, the picture you showed uh, on the screen. Um, it reminds me also of another biological uh, problem. So not leaves, but uh, the wings of insects. They also have uh, some, some interesting reinforcement patterns. And maybe you could also try uh, your optimization approach and, and find out what is the reason why they are structured like they are. And there definitely you will have a wind load uh, perpendicular to the, to the surface. Okay. Yes, thank you. Sure. And once that you were actually thinking about uh, applying this uh, model to the dragon, uh, dragonfly wings. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, it's similar to uh, Matthias' suggestion. Yeah. Um, any other questions or comments? I have one more comment about a strut and tie model. I, I guess when they developed this uh, truss and tie model in the 90s, 30 years ago, uh, one mm -hmm. motivation was to have a simple way to analyze the complex reinforced concrete structures. And nowadays That's with the computational power, perhaps it's, we, it's not necessary to simplify into that kind of uh, truss model. We can simulate the reinforced concrete more accurately using element analysis. I totally agree. But uh, uh, you, you can consider that we, uh, we do the linear finite element analysis to get the accurate design. It's also the computational power is, is become large recently. We cannot do the optimization for the concrete with linear finite element analysis. But once we get the optimized results, we may proceed the checking through the linear finite element analysis. That's our idea. Maybe in the future with the infinite computational power, we can do the uh, optimization in the uh, very elaborate way. So that could be possible. Yeah. Yeah, and I think also part of it is that uh, it is a way to connect to the current practice in the in the civil engineering world, because I think Matthew also made a reference to this, that it can be difficult to introduce uh, new optimization techniques if it's if it's too radically different from uh, from the current practice. Mm. So I think that was part of the of the motivation. But I agree that if you look at this problem as a as an uh, as somebody from a modeling and optimization background, you could also approach it uh, very differently. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Shu Guang Dou um, to Benedict and Mikhail. How does stress singularity around the damage patch affect the fail self design? Benedict or Mikhail? Yeah, maybe I can try to answer that question. Okay. We'll just open a slide. Um, that one. So stress singularities around um, failure. Um, 
I'm not sure if I can answer the question directly, but um, the failure shape somehow, or like also the failure size, is of course influencing the outcoming design. Um, here in in or for the for the square blurred failure shape, the um, the nodes, the structural nodes, are preferably placed uh, between uh, the failures. Um, whereas for the overlapping circles, the struts are preferably placed uh, between these. Uh, circles so they are never removed completely during the uh, optimization process and by that yeah somehow the outcoming design is influenced by that maybe that is answering the question maybe i can just add so that's exactly the idea why we consider these different um, failure shapes and blurring it out to avoid sharp corners because that we expected that to have a strong influence and as mika said also already in the presentations we were actually surprised to see that from left to right for the rectangular shapes uh, you hardly see a, a difference okay thank you benedict and the cap um any other question or comments? Yeah, I also have a question related to uh, Benek and Mika. Uh, the fail safe optimization, considering the stress, is, is a very, to, to me, it's a very challenging computational problem. Uh, did you notice any convergence issues or how did you solve this uh, optimization problem? Of course, it's uh, if you consider stresses, it's very non-linear and sometimes unstable, leading to uh, divergence. Um, but there are some factors which you play, can play around with to reduce the non-linearity. And that is, uh, we use this aggregation technique to approximate uh, the maximum function. And there's just an aggregation parameter. Well, the p-norm, it's, it's a p for the ks function. It's also just a factor. And um, yeah, of course, you cannot choose this factor too low because when the, the max value is not captured good enough, and so you have to find a compromise. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but of course, if you, if you found a good value, that is that is quite okay. It's not too bad. Like you have to run hundred optimization to have one converging. It's more like one of ten div, div diverges. Okay. Thanks, Mika. Thank you. Any other comments or question? And if not, we are close to the end of the uh, session. And I would like to thank all the speakers for keeping their time and for preparing their wonderful talks. And thank all the participants to join us. And um, before I close, I hand back to Jing Wu to say final words. Yeah, thank you for organizing this wonderful session. Uh, I want to announce the next session. Uh, so the next session will be a thematic session on topology optimization for inelastic design. It will be organized by Professor Latasha Damak from Lehigh University. And I also want to uh, notice that so in the, uh, in the next month, we will switch from the summertime to wintertime. And we plan to move our webinar one hour early. So if you are in Europe, that will mean we will start from three o'clock and for people in China, it doesn't change because uh, then the compensation of summer to winter and then this compensation will move one hour early. So for colleagues in, in China, it will be the same, probably the same also for Japan or for Korea. Uh, so looking forward to meet you next time. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, thank you all. Bye. Bye. <laughs>